Why, hello there, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages. My name is Mr. Dogbelt333, and welcome back to Hearts of Iron 4, the New Order, last days of your the jolly old United Kingdom. Now, last video, we found out that things might not be much jollier for much longer. Uh, the winter of 1962 just had to decide it uh, really wanted to fuck with us. So, um, we are really working on trying to get things together. Um, we got our inflation rate down, which was nice as well. We had our uh, economic report. We did not have the growth that we needed. In fact, if anything, it went down. Uh, not quite sure what to do there to fix things, but uh, we're coming along on these. We are building this as much as we can. Uh, we're greasing some gears. It's all coming along. Um, I want to go ahead real quick before I continue. And apologize real quick uh, for not having uploads uh, for this past week. Or this past however the duration of time was. Um, I haven't had an internet though, so I haven't been able to uh, upload anything. Um, I only got around to record now just because I got tired. I'm not uh, well, kind of tired. Uh, I had work and school started up again, so I was kind of busy. But anyhow, this is what we got now. The price of collaboration. The life of Alexei Zagroda had been a long, hard, and miserable one. Born under the boot of and seemingly destined to die under it, his spark rebellion had all but died out. Born in Imperial Russia, he was only a child when Poland was finally liberated. A free nation once more after a hundred years of tyranny. But that freedom was short-lived, a flicker of hope in a century, centuries of misery. By the time he was old enough to enjoy the freedom of his nation, he was sent to war, fighting a desperate defense against the Germans. It was all for naught, and Poland fell once more. From there, his life remained static, working in a concentration camp for 20 years upon the ashes of his former country. Day after day, he performed back-breaking work, constructing the weapons that would be used to terrorize his people. Today was no different. Except the pack parts were seemingly a different make than usual. He took a closer look at the label, seeing a foreign label. It was familiar to him. Then it dawned on him. It was a British label on the product, something he had not really seen since he was a minor Polish soldier. He had remembered hearing about the fall of Britain th through desperately listening to muffled discussions between the guards. While he was distraught by the news, he had hope. Britain would not go quietly. The population would never surrender. There would be a fight... They would fight on, never giving the Germans the satisfaction of victory. Yet there was a British label in the camp. Britain, who had stood up to Polish independence when the Nazi domination seemed certain, was now working freely with the Reich. Poland's greatest ally was working with the Reich. Was there, what hope was there for Poland? The blood-soaked costs of collaboration. Well, we have two questions now. Well, uh, two fat sides go down, rather. Mm. It's still far apart. In the long history of the Union, many political parties have sought to guide our nation towards a stronger, more prosperous future. From the Tories to the Liberals, all have sought to push their vision for Britain. Again, this and all their plans were laid to white east with the fall of the old order. In their place rose the BPP, a party that could rebuild a broken Britain and truly make it strong. However, though we are united in our end goals, our party is divided into two key camps, the ideologues and the pragmatists. Tensions between these factions have been building for two decades now, and the upcoming party conference shall be the crescendo for this conflict, and decide who shall lead our party into the future. Do we lead? No, did not lead. Can I? Okay, I can't add more stuff there. Um, we got eight all around for this. We should be okay, right? <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, honorable members, I would like to begin the presentation for the 1963 budget by stating that the government will not settle for last year's goals. Our economic position has increased by last year's efforts and so too should our ambitions. Therefore, I will state up front that it's the government's goal to gain 4% economic growth by the end of the year. 
morning's paper said this was achievable. Rab Butler had read with particular interest in Financial Times poor work. There's a general sense of optimism about the potential success of his year's economic goals, though a gnawing doubt about the freedom of time said voice in the opposition kept his mood from ascending too high. While all ambitions have increased, our commitment to a sustainable ability has not changed. This government will maintain our goal to keep inflation below 3%. How's that going? Ah, that's actually plausible. On the drive home to Westminster, Butler's driver turned the radio to the home service. Squawking over the airwaves to some second-rate journals was Andrew Fontaine talking about the confidence he had in the upcoming budget. Beneath all the usual rhetoric was some muted praise for Butler. Potentially thought he was just hedging his bets. In keeping with our focus on increasing our expectations, we believe now is the time to shift our perspective from creating jobs to reducing unemployment. To that end, the government will now work to its new goal of reducing the current rate of unemployment to 4%. Up upon up the stairs towards the House of Commons, Butler saw in the hallways of Prime Minister in conference, surrounded by businessmen. He recognized them as representatives of German corporations, the men who, for whom this budget really served. Butler passed them by and opened the doors to the Commons. On to the next year. Well, we've got a nice surplus going. We're putting down our debt. Our credit rating is improving. Yeah, well, this is all... This is, we're, we're getting somewhere, I think. Gonna up this so we can get more taxable population. We'll max that out all the way, actually. A little bit of extra funding towards this. And yeah, we'll max out our, all our social stuff. How much will that do? I'm not quite sure. We'll, we'll, we're slowly reducing the poverty. That's gotta be pretty good. It's coming along. It, it's going to be slow, but it's going to be sure as well. Oh yeah, we got this. Um, inflation we have. GDP growth we do not. Unemployment is close. I'm not quite sure... So this is going to help the old guard instead of the front ideologues at this point. So that's what we want to do, so we're going to go out there anyway. But, as the wheels of British politics turn and battles for the BPP begin, the German Reich, the true master of Britain, watches eagerly on. His interest peaked by the news of power struggle for the BPP. In its eyes and ears, who could, else could possibly take up the role other than Wessenmeyer, Germany's most trusted representative in the face of the Reich in Britain. Vessenmeyer had been appointed to Britain only a decade ago, appointed alongside Domville to re-stabilize Britain after the revolts in the 50s. In their decade working together, <coughs> he had come to respect Domville and admired in some way the work he had done to save Britain. <coughs> I'm not getting shit in my throat right now. I haven't had a cough all day, now I do. Go figure. Um, Domville had been a fine leader on the whole, keeping Britain safe and working hard in hand, with, hand in hand with the Reich. Yet it wasn't Domville who's Encore seemed ever closer by the minute, who currently preoccupied Vessenmeyer, but his friend all but his all too likely successors, Fontaine and Butler. Fontaine offered to keep the flame of Brit fascism burning Britain, and to finish the work transforming Britain, he also offered instability, a young and inexperienced element who could bring Britain back to the chaos, just as Chesterton had. Butler had experience, he had that in spades and could offer a calm and moderate hand to guide Britain to the future, but Butler was no fascist, who only banned the work laid down by his predecessors. His entourage was also full of untrustworthy elements. Two people to leave Britain, both of whom would almost certainly leave their mark on Britain. If you were to meet one, it would certainly help them in their power struggle. But who would he choose? Best Meyer picked up the phone with slight apprehension, called to meet one of the prospecting candidates. Let's the fascist flame continue to shine under Fontaine. Well, the party is heavily siding with the old guard at this point, though no faction has set control yet uh, but we're gonna avoid the winter discontent it looks like and soon we'll have a firm grip 
For 20 long years of BBB has toiled to create a Britain for the modern age. A Britain able to withstand the forces that once brought down the wartime government, the devils of liberalism and Judeo Bolshevism. Though these demons don't infest our nation, the BBP is now set to finally slay these beasts for, be for good and follow Germany fully into new order. Yet, even with our, our achievements, there is an increasing growth in cows and snakes within the party who argue we should be more conciliatory, more open to those not accepting the new order. Nonsense. The new order is upon us, and it would be a fool's errand to seek to run from this. No, the future of our party lies in the Fontaine, in, in the ideologues, and the tight grip of fascism. Um. Yeah, I mean, poverty's going down. There's not much we can do to really cut down on that. Second Malagasy Uprising. Our healthcare policy could help. I think that's why we're working on building hospitals. And we're getting hospitals. We'll get more eventually. Um, let's go ahead and work on the speakers. I mean, great game of British politics. Sometimes one only needs a change, a stage and a microphone to radically change our political climate. Thus, with the BPP conference coming up, the opportunity to give at the opening speech of the conference a chance to set the agenda of the BBP for the future is highly envied and sought after position. For this position, there are two clear candidates for the speech, Butler and Fontaine. Both desire the position for a chance to showcase the superiority of their position, and only one will have the opportunity to make their mark on the party, and with it, Britain itself. <coughs> and we finally have more production units. So we'll... Get working on more hospitals. Hmm. Some days, Peter really just hated his job. Being a coal miner was his blood. A proud family patrician of the Clive, since his great grandfather first took up a pickaxe with several hundred other men and began to burrow deep into the, right, the earth in search of the fuel that would soon power all the British Empire, rising British Empire. He too had felt a rush of pride when he took up a pick for the first time all those years ago in 1940. He wasn't just mining for a paycheck in the other day, but for the whole country to keep the lights on in their darkest hour. But now he only felt a trace of that pride. The old unions had been obliterated in a matter of months. He was soon told that he'd be working for Reichsfucker from now on, and then the briefest glimmer of hope was crushed under the garrison's jackboot. So when he was called in once again to work hours of overtime for the country, he felt but one thing. Anger. Not that he was helping avoid an energy crisis and saving hundreds of lives, that he was quite proud of, and was the only reason he hadn't handed in his re resignation already. What made him angry was that if the gagless, spineless trades in Westminster spent more time finding solutions to the problems in their collaboration cause than shining German boots, they might not be in this mess at all, and he could be at home instead of slogging it out in the mines. As Peter collapsed into his bed that night, exhausted, the anger refused to cool. He'd be back on another double shift tomorrow, paying the price for Domville's ineptitude. He knew most of his fellow miners felt the same way. He'd heard in their voices and seen in their eyes. Collaborators might have dodged the crisis through his own hard labor, but something far, far more devastating was brewing in their heart, the hearts and minds of people across the country. Crisis averted. For now. This will be done a lot sooner. That'll help for healthcare stuff even more. This will be done on the 30th of April. Ah, yes, the opening speech of the annual BPP conference. Arguably one of the defining moments of the conference, it is grandiose and a rousing call of action made by the enraptured membership every year. Due to the significance of this event, the position of speaker is an enviable one. Indeed, it leaves the speaker with a great deal of both personal speech and political capital afterwards. This year, the two main contenders for the position are the two strong men in the party, in party politics. Rab Butler of the Pregnant Action and Fontaine of the Ideologues. Whichever two make the speech, their respective faction will surely be in power. Now, who shall be? Well, Fontaine will be sure to whip up the crowd.
Our healthcare is slowly improving, which is gonna be nice. The little piano line reminds me of Max Payne. It might just be me, but... Well, let's talk about a seat for Jordan. Among the defenders of the government, the B British Free Corps are perhaps the most unrestrained element in our armed forces. The BFC and its political sympathizers, the spirit group, can best be personified as the attack dog of our government, ruthlessly and effectively removing the rot in our society, tearing out the roots of the resistance. At their he head of this organization stands Thomas Holler Cooper, who has devoutly worked to destroy the resistance and keep the UK in the loving arms of the Fuhrer. Yet many of the moderate of the elements of the BPC, Jordan has more of a hindrance. I think they're talking about... There, there's two different people here. I know the other guy they're talking about, but... <clears throat> they see him as more of a hindrance to our reconstruction than a help. Arguing is nothing more than a rabid attack dog. You can barely tell friend from foe. So should we listen to the ideologues and allow Jordan a voice at the conference, or leave Jordan the BFC behind, follow the chaos, with the chaos to the 50s? Seems like an earlier event. They might not have updated that one. <clears throat> so I said, Oswald, is that you? And he looked like I slapped him. Laughter erupted as Lady Bird would finish her joke, mocking the rivals. Always went down well with the old guard. Times like this, this only hit harder. <coughs> surrounded by wealth and power. These parties were their lifeblood in more ways than one, integral for the intricate system of patronage, core to the faction's health, but also an established display of Britain's glory days. Here in these guild halls of fantasy of a fashion empire, ruling the waves in perpetuity seemed almost real enough to hold. Drifting deftly through crowds, Lady Bird would soon caught sight of her target, the Foreign Secretary Ronald Nall Kane, second Baron Brockett. Her fellow cabinet members were, was deep in conversation with a pair of backbenchers or backbench MPs, whom she recognized old ministers from Chesterton's ill-fated ministry. Nothing too important, she would be interrupting then. Ronald, I didn't know you were coming tonight. It's like you practically live at the foreign office these days. <coughs> she said Nell Kane's smile informed her she'd been correct in assessing the importance of the previous conversation. Lady Birdwood, always delightful to see you outside of work. I do apologize for being so tied up in things lately. Barry's taking the recent attacks very seriously, and it has me in constant meetings with our German friends on security matters, not to mention Gerald's ag agitating about the mega corporations again. He replied, picking a glass of champagne off a roving tray. Does he now? Well, after what happened to poor old Arthur, I think it's quite right we bring up in the experts to deal with those traitors. Cockroaches. You don't hear of uprisings in the Reich, that's for sure. And so the conversations went on there, participants happily secluded in this country they govern, and ignorant to the reality before them, celebrating Ray the evenings as they had done for the past 20 years. Like Nero once fiddled as Rome, Rome burn, they instead toasted. Beautifully thematic. Also, about time for us to end. Anyway, I'm gonna go and leave it there. That's just the, the shrugging, that's basically the shrugging meme. That's very funny to me. Anyway. Um, yeah, check out my various links down script box below. Like, if you like, dislike, you didn't leave any comments down in the comment section below. I have real comments. I appreciate any feedback you might have for me. And if you want to keep up with uploads, hit the sub button. Uploads weekdays as well as occasionally Saturdays. That's really it for now, my friends. I thank you all for watching. My name has been Mr. MrDogBot323. I will thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye